one panelist who's still in the queue, but let's uh, let's crack on. Um, so, welcome everyone. I'm Bobby Duffy, I'm Director of the Policy Institute at King's College London, and I'm going to be chairing uh, the session today on immigration policy and attitudes where the Conservatives go uh, next. And this is a joint event between Policy Institute at King's, British Future, and Ipsos, and brings together a truly brilliant panel uh, to talk about these types of issues. Uh, on one of the most important issues facing um, the country. Uh, and this is going to be based on evidence, including where the public are. So I've been studying attitudes to immigration for about 20 years. And throughout all that time, we so often slip into caricature representations of where the public are on this issue in both directions. Um, so I really hope we can get to a more nuanced uh, perspective today. And uh, given the British future, and it's also been two of the key organisations trying to inject some of that balance, uh, I think we will. So on our panel we have first from Gideon Skinner, who's Head of politi uh, Politics Research at Ipsos, uh, and he's going to run us through uh, some of the research that they've done. Uh, then we'll hear from Lord Dave Willits, who was of course Minister of Universities and Science, is Executive Chair of the Resolution Foundation, and among many other roles he's visiting Professor at the Policy Institute at King's. David that's the leaders for another session, but we'll get his thoughts before he goes. Uh, then uh, we're going to hear from uh, Kate Nichols, CEO of UK Hospitality, and then uh, Sherelle Jacobs, who's Assistant Comment Editor of the Daily Telegraph, but is still in the security uh, queue that she will hopefully join us. Uh, and then finally, uh, Sundar Kapwala, who is Director of British Future. Then we've got plenty of time for questions for you. We'll try to wrap up at about 11.45, uh, so we've got a bit of time between things. Uh, uh, so, straight over to Gideon. Uh, thank you very much, Bobby, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, for those of you who managed to make it through uh, the queue, uh, lessons for border security there, potentially. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to run through some findings from the research that we've done at Ipsos and in partnership with British Future, uh, tracking attitudes towards immigration amongst the public over the years. And I'm just going to try to pull out five key findings, five key things that it's useful for you to know uh, about public opinion towards immigration and asylum to kind of set up the discussion. Uh, and the first one to know is that it's quite clear that it is becoming more important, it is rising up the public's agenda as an issue. Um, and we're also seeing some signs, perhaps not surprisingly, that that rising importance is linked to uh, some rising negative views top of mind negative views, at least towards immigration and asylum. But at the same time, it's important to put that into some sort of context. Uh, it's still the case that overall, uh, British public is more positive towards immigration than they were uh, in 2016 in the run-up to the Brexit referendum. Um, uh, Bobby at, at King's with, with Ipsos in the World Value Survey and they're showing that actually British attitudes towards immigration are more positive than, than, than many other countries. So we have to take that into some sort of context, but nevertheless, um, it's clear that the, why the government is wanting to do something on immigration. Um, it's one of the top issues facing the public. It's not quite up there with inflation and cost of living, which are dominating everything else, but it's only just behind the NHS in our <coughs> most recent issues index um, at Ipsos. Um, and uh, we can look at that over time. This is a, a measure that we, uh, we, we collect every month. We've done it since 1974. Um, and we can see that concerns about immigration have been rising. About twice as many people mention immigration as an important issue facing the public um, as they did a year ago. Although, again, you can see from that chart, it's not quite as high, it's not as dominant on the public agenda um, as it was in the run-up to 2016, for example, when there was a real peak. But nevertheless, uh, it has been rising. You know, over the last year, concern about immigration is up. And that is reflected in overall top-of-mind attitudes towards immigration. So just at a very general question, uh, we asked this in the tracker that we run with, with British Future, um, we say, do you generally have a think that not, my immigration has a positive or negative impact on Britain on a scale of, of 0 to 10? Um, that's where it was uh, summer uh, last year. And you can see the red line has gone up a bit since summer. Um, 
43% give a positive score, 37% give a negative score. But that's still pretty much a mirror image of where it was before the referendum, you know, you know when it was flicked around, when the red line was above the green line. People are still more positive than they were, albeit there has been a rise in negative sentiment over the last year or so. And we see a similar pattern when we look at overall attitudes to numbers. Again, I'm going to kind of go break this down in a little bit more detail, but this is just an overall top of mind reaction. Do you think uh, numbers uh, of you know, immigration should come up or come down? Uh, again, this is the overall pattern that we've seen since 2015, and you can see it's generally the red line, which is the portion of people who want to see immigration reduced, has been coming down. But it has nipped up again, um, so just under half want to see immigration reduced as a top line response, uh, which is about the same as the proportion of people, uh, slightly more than the proportion of people who want it to stay the same or for it to go down. But there's still, as you can see, there's less demand for reduction in immigration um, than there was before the 2016 referendum. So immigration is rising up the agenda, there is an uptick in overall top of mind negativity towards um, immigration but it's not the same as it was uh, almost a decade ago. The other thing that underlies much of this change is that it's clear that immigration is quite polarised, attitudes to immigration is quite polarising between uh, Conservative and Labour supporters, between Remain and Leave supporters, between old and young. So if we go back to that uh, issues index question I showed you before, what are the top issues facing the country? Uh, for Conservative supporters, and actually for over 65s as well, immigration, as you can see highlighted there, it's actually equal top, just about the top issue. It's up there with the economy as the most important issue facing the country. Uh, but it's much lower for Labour supporters, and we see a similar pattern for younger people. As well, so the, the relative importance of immigration is much higher for the conservative base and for older people than it is for Labour supporters um, and for younger people. And we see a similar pattern on uh, Rishi Sunak's pledges when we say what are the most important uh, of Rishi Sunak's five pledges, which we've broken up into ten in this question. We see broadly conservative and Labour supporters, they all agree the NHS is important, inflation is important, the economy is important, but there's a big difference. Uh, on uh, cutting back illegal immigration um, and stopping the small boat crossings. It's much more important to Conservative supporters than it is to Labour supporters. And we also see this kind of polarisation, this difference in overall attitudes to immigration as well. What should be done about it? So, for example, do you think numbers should go up uh, or go down or stay the same? Um, these are Leave and Conservative supporters, where you can see around 7 in 10 of those groups want immigration to come down, but that's twice as high as the proportion of Remain or Labour supporters who want to see immigration come down. Uh, and the kind of the driving motives behind their attitudes are different as well. So uh, I'm going to come on to attitudes towards the government, uh, the government's handling of immigration, but we ask people why are you unhappy with the government? Um, and Conservative supporters who are unhappy with the government, their reasons are very clearly around channel crossings, general numbers are too high, too much asylum, too many asylum seekers being too generous. But for Labour supporters who are dissatisfied, it's still the case that channel crossings is a concern for them, it is equal top, but also up there are the ones on the bottom, down the other half of that list, the second half. So concerns that uh, uh, asylum seekers aren't treated well, and that there isn't enough migration coming, um, but migrants are treated badly as well. So it's a clear difference in sort of drivers of attitudes between the two sides as well. Having said there is all that polarisation, there is one thing, um, unfortunately for the Conservatives, that does seem to unite public views, and that is dissatisfaction with government performance. Uh, and even on this topic, Labour are slightly ahead, not by loads, but Labour are slightly ahead. But there is clear dissatisfaction with government performance. Again, this is something that we've been tracking um, since 2015, and in fact, if you, we can go back further and see that dissatisfaction with any government um, of any stripe has always been pretty low. But in fact, 
fact, in our most recent survey, which is the one at the top of that list, we can see that dissatisfaction is the highest we've seen since 2015. And actually, four in 10 are very dissatisfied as well. Uh, and again, we see a similar view uh, when we ask about uh, how well Sunak is, Sunak's government is performing um, on its fifth pledge on passing new laws to stop small boats uh, and making sure that people who come to Britain illegally are detained and swiftly removed. You can see how uh, kind of criticism has been growing since the start of the year. And even amongst uh, the Conservatives' own supporters uh, around, or, or 2019 voters at least, um, around six to seven in 10 are unhappy with what the government is doing. And as I've said, generally, Labour is a bit more ahead. So around about 20, 25% trust the Conservatives to have right immigration policies, policies around asylum and so on. Uh, and that's behind 10 points or so, generally behind where Labour is. So Labour is ahead here. What we find is that Labour benefits much more from much higher support from its own supporters, whereas as we've seen, the Conservatives base a split in terms of their own, what their own party is doing. But it's also true that it's not exactly a ringing endorsement and huge amounts of public confidence in Labour either. So just going down in a little bit more detail, um, what about, uh, what therefore can the government do about some of this? And the panellists are going to talk in a bit more detail, but uh, from a public point of view, I'm afraid there isn't an easy answer. There's a bit of a dilemma for government and policy makers on this. Uh, when we get beyond just the immediate top of mind responses, we find that uh, actually control is just as important for the public as numbers. Um, and there is clear support for immigration for particular sectors, and um, even, again, amongst Conservative supporters. So here's a question we put to people. Um, which of these two options do you prefer? Should the government prioritise reducing overall immigration numbers? even if that means we don't have uh, perhaps enough jobs that we need, or should we prioritise control and selecting who it wants to come to Britain, even if that means overall immigration remains high, which we know that people are not terribly happy with in a, in a top of mind response. And it pretty splits people, uh, but with fewer wanting uh, numbers reduced uh, regardless. So around three in 10 of the public say they want numbers reduced regardless, more four in 10 say they would prioritise control. Again, we see a party split, but even amongst Conservative supporters, they are split. There's not a majority there in favour of reducing numbers regardless. And we can see that even more so when we look at uh, specific sectors. So we, we ask about a whole range of sectors, and some do not get as high as these ones that I'm showing you here, but these sectors are uh, responsible for a, a large amount of immigration coming to the UK. Um, and you can see that around about half or so think that actually we should even have more immigration for things like healthcare and social care. Um, around about one in four uh, want the numbers to remain the same, and only a minority want numbers decreased. Um, and again, that applies to Conservative supporters as well. That's immigration for work. What about asylum? Now that's going to continue to be a hot topic, that's going to continue to be a divisive topic. Um, and again, that is reflected in public views to some extent. So there is, uh, there is sympathy for people crossing the channel. So the majority of people have sympathy for migrants crossing the channel. And support for the principle of asylum, and this is an international study that we run at Ipsos, support for the principle of asylum is actually higher in Britain than it is in many other countries. I'm not expecting you to read all the numbers there, but you know Britain is near the top, you can, you can see. And actually, if anything, support for the principle of asylum has been rising over the last few years. Wouldn't be surprised to see that reflected to, uh, in terms of responses to what's happened in Ukraine, for example, and, and refugees coming from Ukraine. But the public have concerns in pra practice. Um, so around half of people are concerned that uh, many asylum seekers are genuine refugees, um, they're coming for economic reasons. Uh, around half are concerned about the impact of uh, refugees on public services, particularly housing um, and also healthcare. And that is a particular UK concern when it comes to, comes to asylum. And again, 
we find sort of just divisions on what should be done, uh, particularly on those who come to the UK without prior permission. So like the small people coming over on the small boat, we ask gay people two choices. Should everyone be rejected regardless um, of, should everyone be rejected even if their claims might be valid, if they came here without permission? Or should we uh, consider the merits of any claim on its basis, even if someone came without permission? And it splits people. So around about four in 10 on each side. But again, here we do see a clearer partisan split. And just lastly, uh, clearly one response from the government uh, is, the, is the Rwanda policy. Um, when we ask people what they thought of the Rwanda policy, just under half, so not quite a majority, support the Rwanda policy, uh, which is more than those who oppose it, around three in 10 oppose it. Again, a clear difference by party lines. So uh, almost three quarters of conservatives support the Rwanda policy, but uh, only a minority of Labour support it, and there's more opposition amongst Labour supporters. But there are concerns, again, about whether it will really have the impact it is, de uh, it is desired. So around half think it's unlikely that the Rwanda policy will reduce the number of asylum seekers coming to Britain without permission. And similarly, half are sceptical it will provide uh, value for money, and many Conservatives are sceptical about the impact as well, even if they support the policy. So these are just a kind of a few key points about public opinion, um, so just a few, uh, three things to leave you with. Um, it's not surprising that the government wants to act on immigration. It's clear that it's rising up the agenda, and it's clear that it's a particular priority for the Conservatives' own supporters. Um, but it is in 2016, and in terms of a devising a policy response, uh, there's no easy answer. The public wants control as much as it wants reductions, particularly when it comes to immigration for work. Um, and just lastly, whatever action the government does want to take, perhaps it's being held back by the lack of public confidence in the government uh, on this issue to get the balance right. Um, you know, what, it's all very well announcing some of these policies that may have support, but to get sustained benefits uh, in public opinion, uh, is going to need to deliver on them. We saw, for example, a little boost in public opinion when Rishi Sunak first announced some of his policies at the beginning of the year, but that didn't last. It wasn't sustained for very long. And Labour is ahead, although again, not by huge amounts. So, that's me. Thank you very Brilliant. much. Thank you. Good, really brilliant overview of uh, the nuance there in different sorts of opinions and the focus on delivery. Uh, really, really important. I'm going to go straight over to David. David. Hi, thanks very much for the opportunity to comment on that. Um, I think there were four uh, conclusions, observations I draw from that really interesting presentation. The first was, of course, how. Uh, significant the peak was in 2016, with much higher levels of concern than we've seen since, uh, and the peak in just before the Brexit vote. Um, now, it may have, there are lots of reasons why it peaked then and then fell. One may be that actually people just wanted a sense of control. But it is, looking back on my time in the Cameron cabinet, I do reflect on the the two decisions which led to those incredibly powerful images through the summer of 2016 of all the migrants moving across the Mediterranean. And do you reflect on what would have happened if two crucial decisions had gone the other way? So in Syria, um, the Syrian regime crossed the red line of using chemical weapons against its people. And there was an expectation that at that point the West would intervene, and uh, President Obama said that he would. Uh, presented David Cameron with a very tight timescale for getting British support for intervention. A uh, rushed debate in Parliament on a Saturday, I think, an emergency cabinet, which I can remember, um, and a uh, Ed Miliband promising them support, which he then withdrew. Uh, after which Obama then loses his nerve and decides not to intervene, even though the red line has been crossed. And 
a, a, a surge of migrants fleeing Syria after it became clear there was no Western support for them. And then separately in Libya, uh, and a deep concern about the emerging civil war in Libya, leading to intervention by uh, France, then actually probably a driver was Merkel, France supported by Italy and the UK, which uh, destroyed um, an evil regime in Libya, but at the same time creates such disorder that Libya becomes a new route for migration out of North Africa. I think you can argue that if those two knife-edge decisions had gone the other way, if the West had intervened in Syria and had not intervened in Libya, the picture of migration of hundreds of thousands of people fleeing across the Red, both from Syria and Libya, would have been completely different and would have been a very different backdrop in the summer of 2016. Uh, and it's, um, it's one, I think it's one of the interesting um, might have been to this because it is so striking that people are in 2016. Second point is that again the research shows how strongly people connect uh, immigration with pressures on public services and also I have to say also with pressures on pay. And in a country where as our work at Resolution Foundation has shown uh, real wages have barely increased since the financial crash. And when there clearly are pressures in pub on public services, there is an obvious intuitive connection for people to make that this has become because of all the migrants coming in. Now, the economists can dig into the detail about the extent to which migration affects wages. Um, and it's interesting, I think the polling was 46% of people thinking it had an effect on their access to health care. 54% um, saying it had an impact on their access to housing, which is undoubtedly the case. It's clearly an increased housing pressure. So it plays into a wider debate about the quality of an access to public services. Um, sometimes uh, people may exaggerate that connection, but I've been to tell a moral story, which I'm not sure I emerged from this very heroically, but a constituency case, when a Labour councillor brought in to see me in the days of the coalition, a disabled woman who has, was having great difficulty getting her disability benefits. And the Labour council brought her in, clearly expecting and, and, it, and the conversation started on, Mr. Willits, you know, I'm having great difficulty, I can't get my disability benefits, uh, it's a scandal. And I could, you know, it was going a kind of according to what the Labour councillor was expecting. And then she said, and I know why I can't get my benefits, it's because you're providing all the benefits to the migrants. If it weren't for the migrants, I would be able to get my benefits. Now, what do you as a constituency MP say when you are being provided by your own constituent with a kind of alibi? Uh, I didn't say, well, actually, I think this is to do with the way we are running the benefit system, and I'm very sorry, we will try to, uh, we, we ought to be able to run it better so you can get your retirements. I noted what she said, and yes, of course, I'll try to sort out your case, and we, and we, and we, and, and did so as a constituency MP. But I suspect all through the years of coalition, that kind of question, um, do you try to, do you go with the flow that it's the, it's the migrants that sort of the problem or not go with the flow, is a kind of issue that in uh, constituency cases and public debates comes up time after time. Um, the third point I'd make, which is not, wasn't covered in the poem, but just as a former university minister, I feel I ought to just comment on this. Um, of course, the official statistics on migration include anyone arriving in the country for more than a year, and that includes overseas students going to study for more than a year. 
And I continue to believe that it's rather misleading to use, to treat students for whom there absolutely should be an expectation at the end of their course they return back to their home country as migrants. Now, the reason why, I can, again, I can remember when David Cameron in opposition announced on Sunday morning breakfast TV, we're going to reduce migrants to tens of thousands. And in the questions that came through in the hours and days after that announcement, the question was, how do you going to measure migration? And the answer was given, we're going to use the UN <coughs> definition. But I think it is very perverse for the Conservative Party, which doesn't believe that international organisations should determine our policies, to allow its migration policy to be determined by the United Nations. Other organisations, like OECD, have different measures of migration. And when you look at the other countries that have a large, successful uh, sector of higher education attracting people from around the world, I track down how in Australia or the US these figures are treated. And whilst of course it's reasonable, if there's a UN measure, there's a UN statistic to be collected. No other country, none of, our, none of the other countries that like us have a significant flow of overseas <coughs> students use the UN measure as the basis for policy. So one of my Tory instincts is we should not allow the United Nations to determine our migration policy. We should, we should be perfectly entitled, as other advanced Western countries do, to, to define the migration we're trying to control in a way that ties in with our national interests and national strategy. There's no need to find this policy out to the United Nations. And as soon as you liberate yourself from that and say it's people who, are, who actually are aiming to permanently reside in the UK, or something, you get a different policy. It's confused and unnecessary to allow it to shape an approach to how to get from actually it's a very successful British export industry and the main requirement should be that people at the end of their course go home. Um, and my final point about all this is uh, where conservatives are, and the polling did show that conservatives are more worried about migration uh, than people, uh, than other parties, partly because of the age distribution of conservatives, but not just because of that. And I do think that there is a conservative instinct here that we can all understand, and as conservative members, uh, we should reflect, which is that conservatives believe in the nation state. Our belief in the British nation state isn't kind of blood and soil nationalism of the sort that a, a form of patriotism which you can see in some countries, it's much more linked to pride in a set of institutions and their history, uh, which is, thank heavens, hasn't got an ethnic element to it. It's pride in institutions. And one of those, uh, and amongst those institutions, the, and the, the boundaries of those institutions are set by the nation state. And one of the things that a, nation, a modern nation state does is it provides, it's the biggest kind of insurance pool that we've got for covering individuals against misfortunes of loss of income or in ill health. There's a, there's a mutual insurance national rationale for a welfare state that the Conservative can understand. It's not simply a matter of redistribution from rich to poor, it's a matter of all participating in the same mutual support. And I think there's a conservative instinct that you have to show you're a member of this, of this community and have arrived, and if you do arrive from outside, they will be a contributing member of it. And it shouldn't just be open for anyone to get on a plane, turn up and start using the NHS or claim benefits. And we're in the very odd position that our benefit system has much less of a contributing principle than almost any other advanced Western system. The national insurance contribution model has been eroded in the UK in a way it hasn't in other advanced Western countries. So my view is that another way in which we can tackle concerns over migration is by rediscovering what I think is a perfectly reasonable way of operating a welfare state, which is around the contributing principle. If you're a citizen of the UK, you're putting in, you can then take out. And some of the European ministers I used to talk to were surprised 
that given there are all these concerns over migration, we haven't gone down the route which many EU countries have taken to deal with the migration challenge, which is operating a contributory welfare state, so that if you just turn up, you can't get some of the benefits, like, for example, tax credits, which were available in the UK on a much more unconditional basis than benefits are provided in many other European countries. Thank you. Thanks very much, Good and yeah, really important that contribution contribution point comes out really strongly in the qualitative work that we do. Just one one heavy bit of context before we move on to Kate is that yeah, that it's definitely true that the salience peaked around 2015, 2016. But re I think it's really important that someone who looked at this for a decade, you know, the 20 or more years, is to to realise that actually those figures on the percentages of people who wanted immigration reduced have actually peaked much much earlier than that, in the 2005 to 2010-11 sort of period, when you had 8 in 10 people saying that immigration should be reduced back then. So this is not a new thing that just popped up around Brexit or around particular events. That underlying uh, concern has been there for some time, but it wasn't recognised for, for some time, in, in lots of people's opinion. So I think this, is, this has got lots of roots that go quite deep uh, for people, as well as around particular events and, and incidents. Uh, but, Straight to Kate. Well, thank you very much. My name is Kate Nichols. I'm Chief Executive at UK Hospitality. So we're the national trade body for hospitality businesses, pubs, bars, restaurants, hotels, event venues like this, the people who put on the conferences, who give you your breakfast, your coffee, your lunch, your dinner, without whom the economy doesn't function terribly well. Um, and certainly events like this don't function terribly well. So if you've enjoyed your hospitality here at Manchester, um, that's down to, to me and my members. Um, uh, one of the points I would make though, the only big hotel chain that we are missing, the biggest hotelier in the country at the moment in the context of this debate, is the UK government. They are the biggest hotel owner, provider of the mo at the moment because they have the most hotels, the most hotel rooms in current occupation um, because it, they're having asylum seekers. Um, and that's not to make a political point or a pejorative point or any other kind of point, it is just a state of fact in the context of this debate it is quite an important one. Um, what I was going to talk about really was there was the, uh, in response to, to Gideon's excellent presentation and the attitudes and, and the approach, was just to give an economic and an employer perspective on the current debate. So although the debate is very much driven and the public debate is much driven by small votes, Rwanda, asylum, which side we're on as to refugees or asylum seekers, that's not an area that I want to get into. In fact, I don't think it necessarily helps us when we're looking at developing a pragmatic and grown-up immigration system, which is what we really need to be moving towards. Because those are visceral, those are totemic issues. They do dominate the debate and they, they sort of polarize it, but also they mask all of the issues that are, that are going on underneath it. It overwhelms that sensible grown-up debate we need to have, and it's about economic need and, and services. And as we were going through 2015, 2016, debate, if you remember, was all about an Australian points-based system. It was about control. It was not about turning off the tax of legal migration. And I do think it is important in this debate to be able to distinguish between legal migration routes and illegal immigration. And the public debate and the attitudinal survey that we've just seen tend to <coughs> mould the two together. So the second point, I think it was really important from our perspective in, in Gideon's research, control <coughs> is as important as numbers and we have not got that control right, and it isn't working effectively for anybody at the moment. If you look at the attitudes from the public, it isn't working for them. If you look at the attitudes from employers, it clearly also isn't working for them because the current points-based system is too tightly defined. There aren't sufficient nuances within it, and it doesn't look fundamentally at the needs the economy has. So when we were going through the Brexit debate and we were talking about the consultation on an Australian points-based system, that was premised upon economic need. Gideon highlighted some of the sectors of the economy that the public feels supportive of, um, seeing greater levels of migration, fully understand that. But if you can't, if you can bring in the, the, the highly qualified brain surgeons, the nurses that we need, the social care workers, arguably for the public, it's can their loved ones who are being looked after in hospital, do they get a decent level of food? Is the hospital clean? Is as important, I would suggest, as having sufficient skilled workers that are coming in. And at the moment, we focus on the skilled workers. Those are the ones that you can come in almost unrestricted. And we don't have a route through for lower skilled, 
or unskilled migration, um, which is in contrast to the Australian points-based system that is being looked at. So control, just as important as numbers, we do need to make sure that we've got access to the labour the economy needs to be able to function fully. I, I appreciate that this is a much broader debate, but if we just look at my sector of the economy, when we came out of COVID, and if you close down the sector of the economy for two years, you have also closed down all of its training, all of its talent pipeline, all of those routes through to the domestic workforce, and 80% of our workforce was UK domestic. Um, so we have got to close this down. We came out, we had vacancy rates of 12%. They are now down to 9%, but that is still double what we had pre-pandemic. So despite all the efforts that we are making to recruit people locally, to support long-term unemployed, economically inactive into work, we're still functioning with that level of vacancy rate. That means that we are artificially reducing our capacity, our occupancy, our hours of opening by around 20% because we just don't have access to the labour we need in our sector to be able to function fully and to open all of our hotels and event spaces fully. That means as an economy, we are turning away £25 billion pounds worth of revenue. And that's just in hospitality, 5% of GDP. That will be going across the economy as a whole. So there is a legitimate debate to be had that is within the space of control, that is within the context of keeping an eye on public services, making sure we have the, the public services to balance it all out. But the economic need for that different tier of migration coming through is an important one to be having. And I would suggest that it is the flip side of controlling those totemic issues around illegal migration. If there are legal routes to come through, I would suggest you start to reduce some of the illegal pictures of people in small boats. Um, and the humanitarian crisis that that, that, that that evokes. So appreciate there are no um, easy answers, but I do think the time has come for us to be reviewing that, looking sensibly and pragmatically going forward, and being able to look at how immigration can be that bridge to be able to upskill the domestic workforce and supplement the domestic workforce where it's needed. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, David. Yeah, good stuff. Okay. The only thing I'm going to say is on the basis that uh, Kate Morgan for the Tories on the Immigration Parliament, frankly, if the Supreme Court rules in favour of the government in November, maybe there is something to campaign on in terms of Rwanda tackling the small boat crisis. But in terms of reducing legal migration, no way. The Tories came to power in 2010 promising to reduce legal, uh, reduce legal migration to the tens of thousands. Theresa May reaffirmed the part party's commitment to that in 2017. Boris somewhat tried to extricate Tories from this pledge, instead promising to control who comes in through a strict Australian point style system. I think that this has failed awesomely and totally. The post-Brexit regime is a self-contradicting mess with higher processing fees counteracted by a lower salary threshold. Firms are having to pay fees to import foreign workers, but on the other hand, if it makes financial sense, they can actually bring in as many as they want. You've got low skilled migrants brought in through the back door through the exploitation of student visa spouse programs and a relaxation of the rules permitting firms to import not just graduate but mid-skilled workers, including in sectors such as um, retail where the highly graded category might be contested. Um, so when it comes to the high levels of migration, the government has a choice. It either brings in this kind of drastic moratorium which will basically crash the economy or it admits that it has failed. Um, or maybe this, it's the third way, Miranda um, performative politics if you like. Um, but I think that if we don't think about future and what a Tory government can do in the long term, then I think the first thing is the centre-right really needs to unpick what it is that the public actually thinks, and we've seen all the nuances to that. There's a high level of uncertainty around this, and you know, one reading is that public attitudes have become more positive in recent years. Um, on the other hand, there is this question, I don't think we know the answer to it quite yet, it's whether the small boat drama is rehardening attitudes and maybe that's something which we will see either way um, in future. Um, and adding to this I think is this pre-existing paradox which is basically the public thinks that immigration is too high but they want more migrants at the same time, which is contradictory, right? And you can either say, well that's 
an education that the public doesn't really know what it wants, or perhaps what the public is trying to say is that in the short term, yes, we need migrants because we need the NHS to keep working, we need you know, fruit pickers, we need the economy to keep moving, however, this can't go on forever. Um, and that's perhaps where the Tories need to be in terms of accepting there's not much you can do in the short term, but you need a long-term plan, and it needs to be quite coherent. And there is an argument that the Braverman approach to immigration, which is basically scrutinizing immigrants, so raising questions about integration, whether gay asylum seekers are gaining the system, at the same time as presiding over a system which has seen immigration you know, rate rise to an all-time high is precisely the wrong approach, it's the wrong way round. Um, so, yeah, I think that the next stage is to try and articulate how high levels of immigration are potentially in the long term disincentivizing innovation. This is something which I'm quite interested in. Um, because the very fact that migration is propping up the economy, which is basically quite a dysfunctional economy, it's a low wage economy, it's a low productivity economy, is, you could argue, not necessarily, you know, the flip side to that is, it, it's, it's propping up an economy which isn't particularly healthy. And there is this question of a doom loop whereby, you know, even if migrants do deliver a net surplus to the economic system, that surplus, is it going to be enough in an overall stagnant economy to address the increased infrastructure needs that result in a growing population? I have a question about that. Um, but to return it to innovation, so Britain recently dropped the salary requirement threshold for construction. Well, it was, they, they, they dropped it in order to get more construction workers, I think, from 25,000 a year to 20,000 a year. And of course, we sorely need more houses. Um, but the luxury of being able to do that means we are not compelled to invest in you know, automated bricklayers, etc. When you think about you know, care homes, we have the luxury to recruit care workers from abroad. It means that we're not actually thinking about you know, what Japan's thinking about, which is you know, care robots, etc., etc. And you know, I mean, we see this through history. I think like the Romans, who arguably could not progress to the next stage of civilization because they had a slave economy and there was just no incentive to invest in you know, non-human productive power. Um, and the other, the very opposite to that, I think, is America. I mean, you know, we'll hear this argument that America was built on slavery. Actually, the secret to America's success was actually underpopulation, and so it galvanized them to um, put entrepreneurs to um, develop processes of mass production and institutional parts, which is actually the secret to America's um, rise to being a superpower. So actually, um, there is this long view argument that having no incentive whatsoever to invest in innovation because you are basically just importing labor from abroad is to the detriment of a Western country. Um, and my final thing that I want to stress is that the Tory community needs to start making a moral argument for lower migration a lot better. Um, I don't think that suggesting, for example, that gay asylum seekers are gaining the system and then running for cover when the Archbishop of Canterbury requests an audience is actually a very smart kind of politics um, because it actually damages the moral credibility of the right because what you're basically intimating is that, yeah, we kind of think that our views are immoral, but we don't really care, which is, but actually you can make a very strong moral case for why you want to reduce levels of legal migration. The fact is that we are dividing places of Nigeria like do of doctors. There's one doctor for every 5,000 people in Nigeria. So 750 nurses have left Nigeria since 2017. Um, always, I used to report on technology in Africa and I always think, you know, how many AI geniuses are we robbing places like Kenya or? So we need to start thinking about the impact that our economic system is having on, you know, on developing countries. Um, most of the worldwide shortage of healthcare workers, we always talk about shortage of healthcare workers, the worldwide shortage of healthcare workers, most of that is happening in low income countries. Um, and I'm going to leave it there. Brilliant. Thank you. That was really good. That's a lot of sharing. I think it 
bringing in the, the issue of time really, really importantly in two ways. I think that there's a real tendency in this to think once attitudes shift, they're not going to shift again. People always think that this is us now a settled position on people's attitudes to the immigration. When you look at the long term, they just move around. So I don't think it ever comes quite to a settlement like that. But then also, your second point about taking a long term view of this rather than just reacting in the short term, really, really important. It doesn't seem that we have that across the piece, any kind of long term strategy. But finally, over to some. Thanks. Thanks, Bobby. Um, uh, it's good to be here. Um, Shell's very interesting uh, contribution challenge to how we think about this, I think, helps to capture why British Future called its report about the, the data that you've shown us, the dilemmas of control. Because control really matters. Uh, having it and not having it matters. But once you've got it, once you take back control, it all starts to get a bit more complicated. You've got to decide what you're going to do with it. And there are genuine cross pressures about what people want to do with control in different ways. So certainly, certainly there was a big shift in attitudes because um, even before you get to control, having voice about it. So people were not saying in 2016, I'm not allowed to have my say at all about migration. So I had a referendum, it had gone one way, you changed the system, you finally actually leave the European Union, you get the new system, you've got to design it and decide it. Um, you've got more control, you've got more choice, and it's all got a bit less one size fits all, because it's not yes or no, open borders, close the borders, free movement. It's now, um, where are we putting the threshold, and what about care workers, and what about hospitality, sorry hospitality, you're coming out of it, what about something else? So, so Boris Johnson makes choices, ends freedom of movement, he makes some really quite liberal choices, and, and so you end up with quite a consensus on those specific choices, actually, the Labour Party is accepting the defeat, accepting the end of free movement. It turns out that at the time people are thinking, students, yes, students, good, post-study leave, sounds sensible, um, nurses, care workers, definitely high skills, who's got a problem with that? <coughs> Fruit picking, I suppose we'll have to. And so, so you, there's a lot of agreement on the choices, just not what the choices add up to. And then you find out what they add up to. So concern is rising again. There's a debate. Is that the visible loss of control over the channel? Is it the very high overall numbers? Is it both? Is it a bit of both? It's a bit of both, but I think it's primarily the votes. The numbers matter as well. You've got to think, why are the numbers so high? The numbers are really high for exceptional reasons. Next 600,000 is about less than 200,000 Ukrainians, and that was a choice. And it was a really popular choice because you didn't want everyone to do something else, not to not to do something. Um, Hong Kongers, really big flow of migration, a real sense that there was a moral, ethical, political, historical responsibility. This mattered more to Conservative voters than to other voters. Because the Conservatives are older; they know the history of this more. So younger people are more pro-migration, haven't got quite a strong sense of what was going on. What did we say in 1997? What's the long history? So, so to one-off choices. Really, and then some choices that will stay for quite a while with like, you know, the non-EU system is, is broader. So there's agreement on that for a while, and now there's much more partisan polarization around it, around exactly, you know, uh, you know, how do you stop the boats? Do you stop the boats by doing deals with York and hearing the claims, or do you stop the boats by being really tough trying to get the land system up? So that that is the really heated issue. Uh, but the numbers debate, I think, is also there. Now there are three choices about numbers in the end. Uh, Michelle, there's a choice you want to make in the long term, which is cut the numbers, decide to do it, and actually do it as well. Um, the new Conservatives, I think they did something a migration sceptic group hasn't done for 15 years, which is that they said, get it down to net 250, and here's 10 things we'd do to do it. Actually, care worker visas, they're going to have to change, and so on. If you're saying cut the numbers and you haven't got a plan, it's a bit like saying slash all the taxes, but you know, no spending cuts. You've got to actually make the decisions, I know some people make argument, but, but people, people increasingly uh, see that you've got to do both. So, so cut the numbers, be serious about it, except that you're going to have to cut some popular immigration to cut the numbers. That's the choice. Secondly, there's cakeism. Say it will be lower, but actually make it higher. Um, it's, bad for, it's bad for trust. Um, it's bad for perceptions of your competence. Um, there's kind of a case for it, though, because everyone who's not the Home Secretary in government is a bit, well, yes, you know, obviously, cut the numbers, but not in the case of health or social care. Which I remember the Home Secretary is thinking, well, hang on, you know, students. Um, you know, but actually, that's where the public are. It's where the Conservative vote is as well, that the public are a bit cakeist 
in the numbers. And because of, you know, the Labour voters have got less of a dilemma now because in the world of sort of post Brexit and so on, they're about, uh, maybe not have numbers as well. But, but so, so, so the specific choices that don't add up to the number you want are pretty popular, but the number that isn't, what you say about that? And then thirdly, um, which I think Kate will probably be recommending, is except it's going to be pretty high, and instead of promising to cut and not doing it, just really get on with managing it better. You know, how do the public services get managed, uh, healthcare? Actually, like, housing is the real impact. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of other things, if you manage it well, it can come out in the wash if you move the school place, the population with the health service. Housing is, you know, it's 45% of the demand for new housing. So either, if it's going to be high, let's really big up housing. If you really don't want to have a lot of housing, then actually go back to point one and think about migration. Don't end up in uh, these all good ideas and I'll get around to them all, but I won't do them. Um, in the short term, there's an irony here, um, they'll get away with it a little bit more, maybe not on the boats. The government will get away with what they're doing for an ironic reason, that the very, very high numbers, net 600,000, are artificially high because the Ukraine is and the Hong Kong is. So you finally got an immigration promise you can keep which is to reduce the immigration from the peak. So Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak has actually, you know, it will come down now. And if they do nothing, it will come down to net 400, net 350. Now that's really high, but it's coming down. So they say, well, it was very high, but it's coming down. And then we're not having the real debate, which is having had net 250 for 20 years under New Labour, when people said, you know, did you intend it? And it was somewhat unintended. We then had net 250 for another 10 years when the government was promising net 100. And not doing it. So, so this has been tried. So, I think, I think, I think, in a way, you know, they might duck their way through uh, to not really owning is it coming down or, or isn't it? Um, I think promises you can't keep on immigration have been um, bad for trust, mm -hmm. and so I think people have to now go for choice one: actually set out the budget for the cuts you want, take the pain of things you're cutting, or choice three which is actually accept that immigration is going to be high in this country. Let's focus on a housing plan. Let's focus on an integration plan. But although everyone is tempted by the cakeism, let's actually try and force ourselves to make the choices. Great stuff. Uh, brilliant summer of uh, the choices. Very good. So we have about 15 minutes for questions uh, from people. And we have microphones, I think. Uh, yeah, there and there. So I'll take. We'll see how many we get, but I'll take two or three if I can. There's one in the front. There, yes, Hi, thanks for that. Um, I'm Olivia Field from the British Red Cross, so you'll know that we help forcibly displaced people all around the world. And from that work, we're very skeptical that current policies of deterrence, like the Illegal Migration Act and Rwanda, are going to succeed in, in stopping the boats and in stopping people coming here. With that in mind, Gideon, I'm, I'm curious what you think the um, policy feedback is, and could that be a cause of the rising concerns that we're seeing um, about asylum overall? Right. Any <coughs> other questions? Oops. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Can just get the microphone? Great. Hello, so uh, Gali Mishkovich, actually, <coughs> funnily enough, um, at this point in my life, I'm in the luxury tourism sector, hospitality sector. So. Thank you. Um, I didn't realize, uh, indeed, the connection is very strong there, the hotels that are being used for the asylum seekers and the lack of staff in the hotel industry, which is damaging the economy and of course. Um, maybe it's a silly question, but are the hotels obligated to provide their services, their private businesses? How does that work in terms of private businesses and po uh, policies that come out of the home office? Very interesting. Yeah, okay, pretty good. And yeah, right at the back. Uh, question first about the 
So I think it's, uh, tell me if I answer your question properly, but uh, it, it's, it's true, which I think Sundar mentioned as well. I think, although it's not only about the small boat crossings, they, they come up as top of the reasons of dissatisfaction um, with the government. So uh, it is, and, and when you look at the, the things that people prioritise, it's not unreasonable to think that that is clearly part of uh, driving concerns about immigration and taking the point that the public does sort of elide immigration and, and asylum together. Um, so I think that is part of the rising concern, def definitely. The response to it is, again, I can, I can, you, you can see that there is certainly from the Conservatives' own supporters, you can see there is support for the Rwanda uh, plan and a kind of, you know, even if it's simply we want something to be done, and we're a little bit sceptical about this specific thing, but, you know, I think the public is thinking we want something to be done about it, again, particularly amongst the Conservatives' own base. We have asked more, slightly more detailed questions, but uh, in, in the report that's available on our, our website, we can share it, we've got more detailed questions, um, done work on World Refugee Day for the last few years and we've got global attitudes to migration and asylum specifically as well, you might be interested in. Um, but it, it often it just splits people. So for example, just simply on the principle of um, uh, does Britain have to take asylum seekers in if they come here or can it, uh, if there is another country, a third country, whoever that might be, who could take them safely, you know, does, is Britain obligated to take them, or can it, as long as it provides an, a safe alternative, is that a reasonable choice? It just splits the it splits the public. Similarly, it's sort of the principle of what people would like from Rwanda. If you give them more options or a Rwanda-style policy, it splits the public. You get, you know, from a spectrum of doing nothing to being even more hardcore um, than, than than Rwanda. So it, it does just uh, split the, the views. But there's definitely a sense of. Uh, Politician synergies and I want you know I want something to be done uh, about it. I, I meant more. What do you think the role of introducing policies that are not working is in creating that concern among the public? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. With that. Yeah. 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 I think I think it has a similar risk if you overpromise and you underdeliver. So the really low government competence ratings are that people with very very different views angry with the government. There are people who think you shouldn't be trying this at all because it's cruel. There are people who say, let's overdue that you're trying it, but why can't you do it? Uh, you know, and there are people in between saying, can we have something that works? And I think you risk failing on all of those fronts. Underlying this, um, you get a very partisan, very polarised, very heated debate. What the sense is out there, and this will be the case for the next six months, I'm afraid, is that you've just got to choose a new team, control and deter or you team compassion and humanity, and about a third of the population can decide, right, if that's the choice, I know, you know, I know which t-shirt I'm in, I'm team compassion and humanity, probably, or, you know, your team got to be tough to be, got to be forced behind, etc. Um, and if you really carry on, you'll get 40-40 split, if you really carry on for years, you'll get sort of American sort of style politics, and lots of people who lose to 40 percent say, look, can we not? Have a bit of both, but I want to be on team compassion. But could we manage it well? You know, to <laughs> do it all. Yeah, and you've got to be firm to be fair. But you know, genuine refugees from Afghanistan, can't we? Hear some of the cases, but not the other cases, and so on. So, um, yeah, that's why British really future sort of solution version of this is called control and compassion. And then you've got to answer the difficult questions. Mm -hmm. You know, would your safe legal routes stop the boats uh, as well? Do you have returns deals? What can you negotiate? What's possible? Well, what I think is going to distract us more is, you know, the Supreme Court case is going to be really important, and then do you pull out the Supreme Court if you lose it, and do you get a flight off? Do you have lots of court cases back when you're sending? And eventually we might send 300 people here to Andrew, we might not, and that's a really big thing for the 50, 300 people involved. It's 1% mm -hmm. of the issue. And the other thing the government has done is pass a law that says the same section have a legal duty to always refuse to hear the claim, you know, whatever, if you come that way. But there's 29,000 people aren't going anywhere else without any returns deal. So I think, I think we've got to explain. I think it's tough. It's tough for the control and deter people. I think it's tough for the, you know, compassionate manage it well people. We've got to hear some realistic solutions, this is the deal I can get, this is the deal I can't get, here's how I'm going to use the system, and that would take the heat 
out, I fear the politics of the election will put the heat in. Yeah, I take the Rwanda question, ladies, for it about Rwanda. I mean, we have to wait and see what the outcome of the Supreme Court ruling is. It's under the stewardship of Lord Justice Reed, and he is less adversarial to the government than Baroness Hale, for example, his predecessor. Then again, the problem, which would, which explains why the government wasn't able to get its way on Rwanda the first time, is quite serious in that it's a problem with Rwanda's asylum processing system. There's a 100% rejection rate for Afghans and Syrians, and that speaks to actually quite a complex set of tensions around religion in a country with very historic, um, long-rooted uh, linkages between the government and the colonial Catholic institutions and a very high rate of um, religious conversions to Islam. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a tricky and complex domestic issue in Rwanda. So I'm not sure whether that is going to be resolved in a way that the judges are you know, sufficiently happy with that they will rule in the government's favor, we'll see. Um, and I've always been quite skeptical about the Rwanda plan just because it, I mean, it's not on a scale that would be big enough to deter, so it just seems like you know, very um, unhelpful you know, political um, game playing, in my view. Um, uh, but something I do think needs to be done, and I think that Conservatives could do a better job at pointing out that the current system, if we allow this to go on, I mean, it is biased in favor of privileged uh, asylum seekers. Because, I mean, people will talk about how there's lots of young males. The thing that they <coughs> miss is actually a lot of the people who are crossing. They are very educated males. When they do surveys, they find a high proportion of serious crossing, for example, have had um, graduate degrees, for example. And then that raises a question about who is being left behind, who cannot afford to pay passage, um, you know, women and children, the poorer individuals who are left in camp. So the whole international system, as it stands with this, these flows of legal migration, is actually favorable to migrants, uh, refugees, asylum seekers who have means. Um, and so, and that, so there's a way, I think, of subtly changing the tone of the debate because I'm not keen on people going down that road of implying that asylum seekers are scroungers, are liars, um, are young males who are potentially dangerous, but you can scrutinize it from the perspective that it's actually not fair. Thank you. Um, so, Kate, do you want to come on then? on the answer of um, the, the hotels being obligated and then I'll pick up on the, the economic migration. I think it goes back to the sort of compassion and control or are we deterring? Um, the answer on the hotels is some of them are obligated, some of them are not, but the obligation is because we voluntarily gave our hotels. We opened them up during COVID to yes, people who were um, homeless, we housed the NHS, we uh, did it when we had COVID restrictions on travel. We then provided them for Afghan refugees. We provided them for Hong Kongers coming over. Initially, we housed the Ukrainians. So you've got long-term contracts where the industry, which has got a big compassionate heart, voluntarily went into contracts with the Home Office. They are long-term contracts. The Home Office has exercised some of them to be able to house asylum seekers. Uh, and again, they are probably in better facilities than they were, so there is that compassion piece. So yes, yes, some of them are. And, and some of the hotels voluntarily entered into contracts at a time when they were empty, and that was a way of having some revenue. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, on the economic migrant piece, um, I think you are absolutely right. We need to do a much better job. There is a tendency in the public debate to think that immigration is the easy option if we're talking about economic migrants, and we're talking about legal, legitimate routes through of immigration. There is a tendency to think that it's a low cost option. It's, it's employers being lazy. They're not investing in staff, they're just buying people in from outside. And actually there is a significant cost. It becomes a very big economic decision, both for the migrant person who's coming over, and in some cases it will be the employer who pays 
for that uh, surcharge and for the contribution, uh, but also for the employer, and it funds some of our public services. You know, every time you take a high-skilled migrant worker in, in addition to the visa, which is about £5,000 for five years, you are also having to pay £1,500 per worker per year as an, an immigration skills surcharge, which goes directly back, supposedly, to fund training and skills in this country, but actually is, is not ring-fenced, it's not hypothecated by the Treasury. But there is a cost, and I do think we need to have that balance coming into the debate as to why it's beneficial for the economy and our public services if we get the compassion and control right. Great, thank you, Kate. And anyone got a uh, response on the um, access to <coughs> services and NHS charges? Very, very brief point about that. I mean, the charges are meant to bring in a bit of money, but really they're there to reassure the public in the way that the apprenticeship levy and so on is it's to reassure the public. The public never hear about these things that are there to reassure them. But on the other hand, if someone's worried about, because they're just micro policies, if someone's worried about something, you know, David talking about his surgery, saying, oh, well, I think I'm afraid you're wrong, there's an apprenticeship levy, it's not going to stop them being worried because they're worried because they're worried. And so if you want someone not to be worried, you've got to show them that you can manage health services as well and give them health care. The sort of lecture on the facts is a kind of correct thing to do if I don't know you're broadcasting on the BBC and people making false claims against the fact that you want the presenter to step in is that actually there's a, a levy but that doesn't that doesn't change minds. We're having a, a sort of emotions and reason debate really. So you've also got to understand the emotion when you're hopefully trying to have an evidence based debate as well. Very good. Very good I did. Um, I think we got tight I did promise this this fella at the front that we would get to so we're going to do these super fast because I know people love to get on so we got one here. Thanks. Yep. Uh, I think it's on Sam Townend. I'm uh, vice chair of the Bar Council, so I represent the, the barristers in this uh, England and Wales. Um, we talked quite a lot about saying one thing and doing another, and the, the thrashing around of these sort of uh, divergent uh, directions, uh, and that's had an impact on trust in politics and in, in the government. Uh, certainly, we as lawyers feel that there's been quite a lot of collateral damage done on the legal system, on lawyers particularly as you've seen those that act for applicants. Um, and I just wonder, and, and we, we think there's been quite a lot of personal attacks on the individuals, and um, uh, actually that undermines confidence in the system and ultimately rule of law. But I just wondered what your reflections were on that, because there seemed to be a lot of collateral damage, including my particular sector, arising out of this debate, not just sort of straightforward one on Trusted politics and politicians. Very good. Great question. We got behind you. Got a couple of ones. Um, hi, George Barnes. I don't represent anyone. Um, my question is on demographics and attitudes. Is there anything in polling which suggests that younger people are seeing more positive towards immigrants? My sort of general take from what I pick up is that younger people are more favourable and there could be a demographic shift. So those polls that you've showed us might show, say, 15 years' time, a far more overwhelming positive attitude towards it. Yeah. behind again. Yeah, I think that has to be the last one. Um, Emily Graham from uh, Safe Passage. Um, it's been a really interesting um, panel discussion and, and I think more nuanced than some of the other events I've been to, so thank you. Um, I guess for us at Safe Passage we don't necessarily like the distinction that I think has been made throughout the conference around legal versus illegal migration. It's for us more complex than that and it is legal to come to the UK to claim asylum. Um, but um, I guess amidst that complexity is um, you know, the reality of how people have to travel in order to seek sanctuary, which is often um, that they must risk dangerous journeys. And as a Safe Routes charity, we try to provide legal advice and information for people um, trying to join family here in particular. And um, it's just incredibly difficult for people to find any sort of legal pathways or any safe pathways to come to the UK. So um, I guess one of the big questions for us is where do the Conservatives go next? on safe routes for refugees and thinking about the success of the Ukraine scheme um, and other safe routes. Um, but we've seen a kind of decline in key safe routes for um, wider groups of refugees like family reunion and resettlement. So um, does the panel have any thoughts on what comes next? Great, thank you. So I'm just gonna go down the panel 
picking any of those up and any final thoughts from to start with Gideon? Okay, so maybe I'll just do the one of demographic differences. I mean, certainly there are, I mean, age is, is, is a key one. Actually, also you can see in terms of uh, differences produced by gender. Um, so men tend to be more skeptical about immigration, for example, than, than, than women, um, uh, and on other uh, divides, as you, as you might expect. So um, by, by level of education, for example, graduates will tend to be more positive about immigration um, than non-graduates. Um, I think you know, there is a question uh, which uh, we and Bobby have done lots of work on in terms of generational uh, attitudes to it, I and mean, it's always it's, it's always a slight risk to just assume that demographics will be destiny and, and these uh, things will will continue. Um, and you know, also we've seen, as Bobby mentioned, that these attitudes have been volatile. So yes, there may be a kind of an underlying generational difference, but. Um, you know, a big, a big event like Ukraine on one side, or dissatisfaction with small boat crossings <coughs> on the other side, it will, it will kind of change views across across the piece as well. You know, these things are not simply going to be set in stone by people's demographic. I really haven't got anything to add to it. I mean, they're they're not really yeah. me in the interests of time. No worries. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, on, on demographics, um, yes, it's age. But it's age because of education and because of contact. So if you find young people that haven't got good educational qualifications, fewer, thankfully, or don't have interactive contact you know, to where they live, they, they will be less positive than, than uh, you know, older people who do, uh, and so on. And politics will continue, continue to, to, to shift. So I think it will be more complicated, but it will also be a challenge if the, if the tone doesn't soften a bit, if attitudes have, have softened. The lawyer question is really important. Look, politicians could be in danger from people with very dangerous views and attitudes. We see politicians in different parties assassinated. You know, if, if we can't take the heat out of this debate, then you know, that might just be a very rigorous and robust debate you know, that Nigel Farage wants to have or someone on the left wants to have, but it could also be dangerous for people in NGOs in the law. So in challenging that, um, it's challenging, but we also want to take the heat out of it. So I'd also say to lawyers, let's not immediately jump into sort of saying these are the Nuremberg rules and so on. Uh, you know, let, let's try to let's try to think. As there's a golden rule actually, if you want to project a norm, always try and tell people what they can do before you tell people where the line is. It's of course, not racist to have the kinds of debate about low immigration that we were hearing, but obviously if you bring racism into that, when you're doing that, here's a lot of space, but here's not the space. So you know, if we can be clear that you know, if, if there are lawyers who are you know breaking the rules or something, then there are good processes. To do that, and then can we take the temperature and heat out of the debate? Politicians might not, might not do that, but also you can hear that's the debate. If we want to defend a legal framework like the European Convention on Human Rights, we don't want people to sort of hear you haven't understood it. You're a bit of an idiot, and you know you're probably a, you know not democratic at all. We want to say, look, here's why we chose to have this. Here's a, a, a democratic debate about it. Lots of people in the law think this. Here are some lawyers who think the opposite um, as well. But make the 